Welcome everyone, I am Nadia Greco, international relations student at the Central European University and it is a pleasure to be here with you today. We at the Roma Students Association have been wanting for a while now to have this conversation with Mr. Paxson. And given that um, this year we mark 50 years since the first Roma Nation Congress, it made sense to do this interview at this moment. The first Roma Nation Congress um, ha has a particular importance for the Romani community. Given that at that Congress, uh, Roma claimed their right to have rights. They have proclaimed themselves to be a nation by introducing a Romani anthem, Jelen Jelen, by um, designing the Romani flag, and uh, also by refusing to be named by others through um, racial slurs and insisting uh, that the word Roma is used when referring to Roma. So today we will learn about the first Roma Nation Congress, who organized it, why, who supported it, who objected it, and also what is the legacy behind it? How can we um, contribute to preserving the legacy of the first Roma Nation Congress? Joining us today, Mr. Gratan Paxson, who is a prominent activist, very well known for his diligent work, but also for his compassion and solidarity with Roma. Also with us is Michal Mijiger, um, or Miju as we know him. Uh, he is um, a prominent activist, Roma activist from uh, Czech Republic. Uh, he's currently finalizing his uh, studies in comparative history at CU, and he's known as an educator as well. Uh, we also have Maria Tanasova from Bulgaria. Uh, she has recently been awarded with the Young European uh, Award for 2020, and she's um, finalizing um, her studies at the Romani Studies uh, Preparatory Program uh, for Roma at the CEU. Uh, and with us is also Serjan Baftiari. He's a prominent uh, Roma activist from Montenegro, known also across the Western Balkans uh, for his uh, journalist work and activism. So, um, welcome Mr. Paxson. And maybe we could start by uh, you giving us a little bit of background on how you actually met the Roma for the first time and uh, how you were escaping um, the military drafting and the violence of the state um, and moving in your 20s to Ireland, meeting the Roma and how this story of solidarity and compassion uh, started um, when you were a young man. My father was a lawyer. Um, and I was fortunate to travel quite a bit as a child, and one of the places I went to was Yugoslavia, right back in 1952. And I was all over the Balkans. I went back to Yugoslavia when I was 15, and then it came up to being in school and getting out of school like everybody else. And then what changed my life, having signed up to be a journalist, a young journalist on a local paper, was getting my call-up papers, because at that time military service was compulsory. So I thought, thought about how to get out of this military service. And I thought to myself, well, I have relations in Ireland, people I don't know, but people who are back in my family, my, my grandmother and grandfather came from, came from County Wexford in Ireland. And so I tore up my paper and went on the run from the British Army and went over to Ireland. And it was a matter of survival that I, moved in with the travelers. I got myself a caravan, a pony, and I started uh, you know, living as a traveler. My connections with the travelers are this way and that, I don't know. I have Collinses and so on, people who, who may, um, may have been travelers in my own family. It was tough. And it was all, as I say, survival. I had no idea of being an activist, being a, anything like um, you know, a supporter of a campaign. But a couple of things opened my eyes to what was going on because I, I was in my wagon one morning and a big burly man came up. 
He was a man we call Big Bill. His background was through the Spanish Civil War. He had been on the Franco side in the Spanish Civil War and was now the chief bailiff of Dublin Corporation. And his job was to move on travelers like me. And he banged on my wagon. He said, you've got to be off here in one week or you're going to get something or other. Something bad's going to happen to you. I don't know what. Take you to court, I suppose. So myself and some other travelers who were just down in the street there, they were in a tent, one of these old, what we call bender tents. And we moved up together to a place called the Ring Road. And unknown to me, there'd been a very big eviction just a couple of months before from a place called the picturesquely, the California Hills, where there are about 20 wagons, think, I think, up there. And they'd all moved down to this piece of factory land near the Grand Canal. This is in the west side of Dublin. And they told me pretty, things were pretty bad. They'd been moved on. Could we make a stand here? Could we do something that might at least deter Dublin Corporation from moving in again, led by Big Bill and the police, the Gardas, they call them in, in Ireland. So the idea was to build a school. And myself and some other young men, we went off around, around the corner to a scrapyard owned by travelers. And they fortunately had some school desks, amazingly, they had some school desks, they had bits and pieces, they had a big frame, a door, and we built a school just a kind of a shack school. And this seemed great. And this was around the Christmas of 1962. And we started school. A couple of students came up from the university, people like yourself. And one week later at dawn, suddenly we realized they had come for us and they were going to evict us. All the children packed into this little school and we sung a couple of rebel songs and we said, we will resist. You know, if, you, if you're gonna pull this school down, it will have to come down on top of us. They put a chain around it. They started to pull it down. We had to come out and we negotiated to leave. I said, we will leave by two o'clock. So we all lined up outside with our wagons. There were about 18 wagons on the road. And we started off down the road. And when I look back, that school was on fire. And I can tell you that those flames is what set my, my mind, my heart going and my feelings. I knew that I had to, we had to fight back. It was going to be a fight back situation from now on. That's what kind of got me involved as an activist. After that, we were evicted about, from about 10 places around Dublin. And finally, we pulled into a huge field opposite the Sherry Orchard Fever Hospital. It was a huge piece of land about, I would think it was about um, well, 26 acres of land. And we went in there and eventually a lot of travelers came from different sides of Ireland until there were 400 of us. We built another school, we barricaded it. And we said, this is where we make our stand. Now there was nothing really much about human rights, but there had been a commission by an Irish judge and a report saying travelers should get better treated. But their idea of better treated, listen to this, their idea of better treated was, if you will give up your wagon for burning, we will give you a council house. So in other words, if you're prepared to give up your traveling way of life and be integrated was a very dirty word then and a couple of people did but the most of us hung, hung out in cherry orchard for two, two or three years we we're on that piece of land until one day we looked at the school and uh, there was a whole battalion of police out on the road a whole battalion of police guard as they call them and down the road was a lot of buses full of workmen who were coming up ready to act with Big Bill and to be led into our camp. So by then being the spokesman, I had to cross the road and face this, this um, the main chief, Hodja, the main piece, the big policeman, you know, and I said to him, look, if you come in this camp, 
Look at the people at the fence and they're all lined up there with sticks and bars and ready to fight. So it looked as was a bit of a bluff because we were afraid. But I said, if you come into this camp, there's gonna be bloodshed. So there was a dead silence. We all stood there and they conferred together. We, can, we talked among ourselves a little bit. And the next we knew, they had all swung around and were marching away down the street and we had won. So a couple of milk bottles were hurled on the road. A couple of sticks went over. A few stones were thrown. It was the end of the thing. And the whole issue went into court and it was argued in court that due to this commission on itinerancy, something had to be done for the travelers at Cherry Orchard. And out of that stand, the very first caravan park was provided, a place called Abra Park. And in the meanwhile, I had been visited from France, first by Vida Voivod. I don't know if that's a name familiar to John L. Rotaru, his name was. He came out of, uh, out of uh, Bessarabia at the end of the war. He'd lost a lot of families in the Holocaust. He got to Paris and started an organization, Community, Community Mondial Gitan. He came over to, to me in Cherry Orchard, 1964, and had great discussions around the campfire for about three days we were there. He was there. And he said, would I return in a conscious effort to organize travelers in England? Now I was in a difficult position because I knew that, you know, I was on the run from the army. And if I went back to England, I would be arrested or that. But fortunately, when I got back to England, not to keep, not to have this story go on too long. Uh, when I got back, there'd been an amnesty. So I was not picked up by the military police, although they had been to my house looking for me. And in 1966, I was able to form the Gypsy Council. And we did this in a pub, which I picked out specially because the pub on the door said no gypsies. In other words, no gypsies served in this pub. There we go. That's how it all started. Between 1966 and up to the First World Romany Congress, there were a lot of battles all around England because we had one simple, one simple uh, law of action. Our law of action was stop evictions. Wherever a local council is going to come out with their bailiffs, with the police, we are going to stand our ground and we're going to fight back. And that was pretty successful. There were some very, very successful travelers and very militant travelers who were able to do that. I remember Tommy Doherty, who'd started his own campaign back in 1959. He he brought a hundred caravans onto one piece of land. Now, no small authority could deal with so many, such big numbers. And then we had the Battle of Brown Hills where they pulled 40 caravans out onto the road, including mine without the wheels on. And we said, okay, you put our, you put our caravans on the road, so? And the chief of police says, look, you're blocking the road. You're blocking the road, man. You've got to get off the road. I said, we're not getting off. We didn't allow our caravans to be pulled out there. This was done by force. You have forced us out onto this road. And eventually by a lot of argument, they agreed on this. And the council came back with their tractors and pulled us back onto that piece of land again. So we, we learned a lot of things this way. We learned there were, were tactics, there were ways of resisting that could be effective. And we were so effective that eventually the government called us in, that was the Ministry of Housing, to talk to us and there'd been a, a law passed, the 1966 Caravan Site Act, which was enacted actually in 1968, which made it a, an obligation on every council and of every town around England to provide a caravan site for travelers. That's really um, one, of the, one of the things that um, we would also like other people listening to this is to understand how important it is to actually be in contact with Roma when you want, when you are an activist or when you are working on policies related to Roma. That's why we, we are uh, very grateful to have you today because you're someone who actually uh, became an activist through true activism, being on the streets, living with Roma and understanding the struggles of Roma. 
Um, Miju, uh, I think that you um, might start with the questions related to the Congress itself, now that we have a little bit of context and background on about Mr. Paxson. You know, I'm really amazed. Uh, I consider it like a miracle in the history of Roma when Roma left India and after all the enslavement and also persecutions uh, like throughout all the centuries, the uh, like the Congress in 1971 is like light in the history of Roma, like some home, how, uh, how it uh, looked like and which the activities uh, were running uh, uh, during the Congress, if you can share with us. As well as I mentioned, I was fortunate to do quite a bit of traveling and in 1968, I was for instance in, in the Czech Republic, no, it was, not Czech Republic, it was Czechoslovakia. And I met with Dr. Jansi Bula, who in fact came, became second president of the World Romney Congress. And there was a lot of talk already going on in Paris. There'd been meetings in Paris with, with, with both, uh, with Vida Voivod, who was then replaced by Vanka Rudo. I don't know if that's the name also you know about Vanka Rudo discussions about a Congress, the need for a Congress. Even Breiter had said this in Ireland, like in 1964. But nothing moved. Everything seemed to be a little bit stuck. And there was a very ambitious idea of having a Congress at the Palais de, de UNESCO in Paris, which had been very grand and very impressive, but we couldn't have it. So back in London, talking to my my friends on, on the Gypsy Council, we decided, look, let's, let's get, give this a bit of a jump and let's have the Congress in London, or at least let's have a big gathering of people and discuss how a Congress can be held. And this is really how the 1971 came, came about, the 1971 Congress came about, with the idea of coming together, trying to, well, we succeeded in breaking the Iron Curtain, having people come from Eastern Europe and from Western Europe come together there were at that time only about 12 organizations in the whole of Europe. And I think that at least 10 of them were representative and then, and perhaps we missed out the um, Zigeuner Mission which was in Germany at the time and a Pan-Hellenic Roma organization in Greece, which I learned about later when I was living in Greece. So various groups of people were able to come, they got to London and we sat together in this building, which, which you see here. And it was a great gift having that building because it just happened that a traveler called, called Brian Raywood was working there as the cook. And Mr. Baker, who owned the school, he, he let us have it. It was a holiday time. He said, you can have it. You can use the library. You can sleep in our beds, which were bunk beds you like boys have in, in residential schools. And so we sat around on that library on the 8th of April, 1971. And we said, what shall we, you know, what is this? Is this a preparatory meeting to plan a Congress or shall we have the Congress now? And of course, everybody said, let's have the Congress. You know, there was no doubt about that. So it became the first World Roman Congress. And of course, one of the things that the Congress did was to declare that 8th of April should always be remembered and celebrated as Roma Nation Day. You know, and I get, I get disappointed nowadays because you hear all kinds of different names put to that day. You hear, hear it being called the International Roma Day. But what's international about it when we are one nation and made that particular Congress for the purpose of establishing the Roma Nation? I can imagine, uh, like to organize uh like the Congress with the participation of delegations uh, from Eastern Europe. At that time, when New York uh, was uh, divided like by Iron Curtain, how did you communicate with the people? And uh, if, you, if, you had, if you had some like the moral or financial like the support for this, uh, uh, who was like the partner uh, like the, for you? The Gypsy Council hosted it and I, as General Secretary of the Gypsy Council, had to do a lot of corresponding. And in those days, you had to send off a letter 
and you have to wait two weeks to get back. It's not like two seconds and you get an answer back with the fantastic technology you have today. So it was slowly built together. Yugoslavia played a large part, um, I suppose, in a way that there was a more liberal regime, if you, if you believe that. Uh, I later on lived in Yugoslavia after the Congress, and I found it was for and against being a Rom in Yugoslavia. But a group came from Yugoslavia, a very important group, headed by Slobodan Bebeski, who was our first, our first president. And he famously said, we cannot, he, he, when he went back afterwards, I think this is a good point to make, when he back, went back to Belgrade afterwards and wrote his official report, together with Faik Abdi, who was the first Rom elected to the Macedonian parliament, he wrote in his report, we did not have on our agenda discussion about Romanistan, but I have to say that in all our hearts, that feeling was there that the Roma must somehow come together and that every place where a Roma lives, every place we are, is a little part of Romanistan. And I think nowadays it's quite clear that we now have a, a virtual Romanistan and what we are doing today is part of that virtual Romanistan. So that's how the Congress came to an end in, in a very happy atmosphere, in a very um, militant atmosphere too, because the other thing that we did was to adopt the flag, which before the First World War, before the Holocaust and before all the terrible events of the Holocaust, it had simply been a plain flag, blue at the top, green at the bottom, and had been raised, as far as we know, at least back to 1934 in a Congress in Bucharest. 1934 being the very year that the Nazi party came to power in, in Germany. So onto that, onto that flag was embossed this beautiful wheel. And it came about because somebody from the Indian embassy in London, Mr. W. R. Rishi, now he came as a private person. He didn't come because the embassy sent him there. And in fact, we didn't have any help really from India at that time. But Mr. Rishi came and he said, look, let's make it quite clear to the world that even though today Roma have no state, there is in your background and heritage, the state of India. And, and India, of course, had become the biggest democratic republic in the world. And we were very proud and glad to have that connection by having the the wheel on, on the flag, which was very similar to the Ashok Chakra on the national flag of India. So that's how that came about. And the anthem, you want to know something about Jalem Jalem? We took a bus up to Birmingham because in a town just outside Birmingham, Walsall, three children had been burned to death in a caravan in the circumstances that their caravans had all been pulled out onto a place, George Street, and one of them had caught fire. So it wasn't a deliberate act of arson, but it was an accident that had come out of the fact of being evicted and not being left alone, where we said we should be left alone. And we took this bus up to Birmingham, and Thomas Holomek came and led us in a protest at the local police station. He stormed in there. He was quite angry. We we're all angry. And on the way back to London, Jaco Jovanovic wrote the new lyrics for Jalem Jalem. And the, one of the lines he put in there was about Ikali Legia, Ikali Legia, that the Black Legion had killed our family in the war, in the Holocaust. So that's how the Jalem Jalem came about. We stood around that fire, memory of those three children, and sung it for the first time to the words that Jaco had just been writing. I would like to ask you, what were as well the other the other goals or the mission of of the first the World Roma Congress? Yes, we were very ambitious, and I'd just like to 
put in also Anton Fatsuna, a partisan hero. I'm sure you know about him. And I suppose he, he was also one of the inspirations. He couldn't come. He was, he was from Bratislava and he could not come to the Congress. But he, I don't know if you heard that, but he wrote, he worked on and wrote the first constitution for the World Germany Congress. Although in effect, it wasn't a very good one because it seemed to be too much on the communist sort of centralized level. And this is exactly what we're doing today in the Jubilee Congress is to have an open Congress with everybody participating and more, de more democracy and more openness and transparency. Yeah, yes, we were very ambitious and we set up a number of commissions. For instance, there was the War Crimes Commission and it couldn't, to be honest, do much except we did start to collect together the, the first uh, inf real statements and so on about the Holocaust. And, and it enabled me to write the book in 1972, that was the following year, which was Destiny of Europe's Gypsies, which was the first statement and uh, bringing together of statistics and so on about, about the Holocaust. It has been much improved on since then, and many other people have contributed to the history of the Holocaust since then, but it was the first statement. And it, it was hoped, you see, at the time that Germany, West Germany as it was, would pay a reparations, a block reparations to the Romani people as had been done to Israel. And it was the hope of by the Voivod, one of the planks of his campaign, to have India act as trustees for such a reparations and that was making at least one step nearer the possibility of the foundation of a state, though nobody could sell, tell, us, tell us where it might be. At least we've had the ability to ask for such a thing and work towards it. So we've got virtual Romanis done, but not real earth that you can pick up in your hand. So that was one part of it. We had a social commission that was headed by Bike Abdi, and when later I went to live in Shutka, we had a great number of talks about what the Social Commission might do. And he had founded by then the Party for the Full Emancipation of the Romani people. And together, we wanted very ambitiously to have the uh, party, that party for the emancipation of Roma, to be a whole European-wide party. But of course, there are all kinds of restrictions at that time. This was, this was just in the early 1970s. So that was never realized, but it might be realized today. And there are people I know in Serbia today who want to organize at the community level and have a party um, which would have its own party democracy that would have an election of representatives and so on in, in, in the way any party might do, but to be European wide. So that was another thing. We had, of course, a lot of hopes about education. I, I had a lot of strong feelings about education, having built the two schools in Ireland. And it was hoped that uh, we would start promoting Romani language being used in schools. And one of the key people working on that in Shutka at that time was Shaip Yusuf, as we called him, Professor Shaip Yusuf. I've got on my shelf his, his, his grammar that he wrote, the first grammar written in Macedonia for, for um, possible use as, as a step towards Romanian schools. And I believe in Shutka now, Romani is in the school, at least as a secondary language. So there was, those were the different streams and ambitions and ways we wanted to work along. A lot has been left, left to be done to your generation. Do you believe that um, the Congress itself um, was successful? Very successful in a, in, a, in a symbolic way because now our flag is very much recognized and we, we expect on April the 8th that uh, the European Union will, will have a meeting and pay respect to us. But of course, they're going to make that big mistake of, of calling the International Roma Day, but at least they are exposing our flag and paying respect in that way. Yes, I think it was very important symbolically. Times were still difficult. Um, the name Rom, 
Okay, we got, we threw out the word gypsy, we, Zigan no longer, Zigoina no, no thank you, and we had Roma. But unfortunately, I see in the British press that you've got Roma migrants and, they, and, and tens of thousands of people <coughs> are facing deportation following Brexit. And they're using Roma almost in the same way and with the same derogatory feeling around it as was Gypsy. So in a way, it's, it's difficult to uh, change things unless, you know, we have to fight a bit harder to get real change taking place. We're often fighting for things happening in the media, but we still see things happening in the Mahala where there is no road, the housing is not is legal or not legal, and people can come and knock down the houses without anything happening, and things are pretty bad, very bad indeed. In fact, it's a crisis. I, I started as, I became an activist in a kind of different way because it was a matter of survival. But you people who are coming up through university, it's a very different situation. And I have to say, I hope that you will take inspiration from the first Congress, from, from what earlier activists did, and help your own communities in the way that there needs to be help. In other words, leadership. There was a meeting this morning um, of the Jubilee Committee making plans for the Congress, and we were saying there are a lot of young people now have been trained. We've seen lots of training sessions and many, many conferences. We need now to move to action where young fellows who are ready for it can go back to the villages, go back to the Mahala and look at those very down to earth problems, the problems of statelessness, the problems where people can't get their, the social benefits they need. Maybe they can't get to the doctor. Maybe there isn't a proper road into the village, all those issues. And believe me, because of my experience with the help with the inspiration of a person like yourself, any one of you, people will come together very quickly and fight, very much so. People will fight for their rights once they're given a little bit of support and a little bit of encouragement from people who already got it in their heads that, hey, there's a United Nations Charter of Human Rights. We've got all kinds of tra charters and promises and pieces of paper that say we have rights. But hey, where are those rights? And it's up to you folk to, to organize your communities and fight at ground level for those, for those issues which are so blatantly obvious to us. We all know what the problems are, but where is the solution? And I'm hoping that this Jubilee Congress that we're having now, which is open to everybody and is, an, is stretched over a month. So there's a lot of time to discuss, a lot of time to think how best we could restructure ourselves in, in an effective way. Because amazingly, whereas for the first Congress, we only had 12, 10 uh, organizations to call upon to bring together, there are now hundreds, maybe there's a thousand small and large NGOs and organizations, and yet we're not so effective. We, we, we really have not been able to get a political voice which would be appropriate for the numbers, the 10 million Roma in Europe should have a, a strong voice. In fact, that's another thing I get quite upset about because I still see that Roma are referred to as a minority, even as an ethnicity, whereas we are quite a middle-sized nationality. You have very nicely brought up the NGOization of the Romani movement and how this huge number of NGOs does not necessarily mean that a lot has been achieved. Uh, now we go to, to Maria. Yes, thank you, Nadia. Were there any internal divisions among the participants of the Congress? Yes, of course. Of course, there were things that we had to smooth out. And I suppose the biggest issue, but first of all, there was a personality thing because Dr. Jan Sibula, after I'd met him in 1968, had managed to leave Czechoslovakia and live in Switzerland. 
So at that time, he was regarded, of course, by the socialist authorities as somebody who had kind of, you know, left under a bad atmosphere. And when Toma, Toma Holomek came and the others came, there was a difference between them, they, those who had come with official permission of the Czechoslovak government, and Dr. Jan Sibula, who was in effect an, an emigre, and they met together and it took, you know, a while, I suppose they were talking in the dormitory through the night, but things, they got together again, again but that was one of the kind of differences, um, political differences. One of the main difficulties is regarding where the Roma were going. The thing was, the people who came from Eastern Europe, and this might be true even today, were saying, look, the great aim must be integration. Those people who are out on the road in caravans, this is a very bad way of life. You people better give up your caravans and get into houses and get jobs. And people from the Gypsy County say, wait a minute, we've been on the road for a thousand years. This is our way of life. We're independent. We don't want to live in houses. And that's, that's a very strong feeling today. A very strong feeling today. And the strange thing is, the irony of history, if you like, is of course in recent years, with, with, the, with the EU and the development of free travel, and the, the very bad things that have happened since the, since the 1980s through the 1990s, when somehow or other there was rise of racist, racism, and many people have been forced to leave homes in Romania and Bulgaria and Serbia, Yugoslavia, and go on the road, have been forced on the road, hoping to come to Germany and so on and Belgium, but have been stuck on the road in caravans and living in those small shacks. And it's become if you like, to put it that way, a kind of gypsyization of people who are Roma and who were living in their mahala and who are beginning to get a better life, but suddenly thrown back on the road because of this bad racism has come up, and as we call it, ciganism, anti-ciganism. Um, so there might be a million people probably on the road today. So again, we ask ourselves, you know, what is the way of life? There is, there is an ancient collision between nomadic peoples and people who live in houses. And I personally, in this time of crisis now, when you know, the whole planet is, is, is uh, in a pretty bad way, I think we need to stick to our old ways and that they have great value. And maybe the Roma have something to teach the Gajé about survival and about a way of life which does nobody else any harm and that we serve a purpose with the different trades going around in caravans. And let's keep, allow us to keep doing that. But just yesterday I was hearing, you know all about Dale Farm and the battle we had there. Another camp near to Dale Farm, there are 11 people being told they will go to prison if by next Wednesday, and I'm talking about next Wednesday now, they don't get off their land go back in their caravans and start traveling again, they're gonna to go to prison from four to eight months because they never had planning permission to live on that piece of land. And that, that's, that's the kind of situation we're, we're facing here. So we're still facing the old battle of the right to travel and the right to a way of life, which has a lot of value to it. And also, I think it's important to mention that um, some of the Roma people are not necessarily um, connected to the nomadic uh, living, but then when they actually want to get jobs and they want to participate um, and, uh, in different kind of jobs offered by the mainstream, um, that they are limited to certain jobs. And that's why many people feel hopelessness and they are not sure how they can actually contribute. Because if you are Roma and you want to, want to obtain a job, usually you can only obtain certain kinds of jobs with, which the non-Roma uh, do not want to do, such as cleaning the streets or, uh, as it was in the past, mining. Um, so it also brings a lot of hopelessness uh, for the Roma, even when they want to uh, be more included um, in, in the society. Um, Maria, do you have uh, any other questions? I think there were more questions related to the relations within the movement. Yes. 
The following question is, what tactics did you use to ensure the group cohesion? It, it's not really a question that, 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 I, that, that I feel that I can respond much to. We sat around a table, it was a, a library with, with books on the shelves. Um, language was a very, very strong thing, the different dialects coming together, people feeling their way through, through understanding to each other. And uh, of course, the prepare, pre pre preparations of the Congress had, had created an atmosphere where we, want, we needed to come together and we needed to create those symbols that would go forward from that Congress. I often say that the First World, World Congress had the easiest task because we had a, just a blank paper. We could, we could so easily say, right, we don't want to be called gypsies anymore. Call us Roma, that was easy. We had the flag and we had some discussion and we came up with the red wheel and we sung Jalem together. Singing that anthem for the first time together was a really great thing and it brought us close together. And when we went, of course, to protest at the, at the police station over the children's deaths, all these things brought us together. So I can't say there was any particular tactics to bring us together, but it was a kind of a natural process that, that brought us close. Um, I would say one of the unfortunate things were that when the Congress broke up and everybody had to go back to their countries, it wasn't so easy to communicate anymore. I went off to, to shoot gun, and then I was living in Greece for a number of years, but everything was quite slow, you know. And it was seven years before we could organize a second Congress in Geneva in 1978. Things moved very slowly in those days. These, this time with your generation, things are moving very quickly and perhaps they need to move quickly. My last question now is, who were the main supporters of the Congress? We didn't have any supporters, believe it or not. We sincerely had no supporters. In fact, the people in the village, which is Charlesville, had collected £4,000, which is quite a lot of money in those days, because they wanted to get rid of gypsies. A lot of families were living along a roadside, the A20, down in Kent and they were facing eviction just as just like as I had in Ireland. The police were coming around every day and there was nobody supporting us. There was, it is believed by some people that the Indian government supported the first Congress and I'm, I'm sorry to say they did not. There was no support and it was done really without any funding and as I said we're very lucky to have got the school so we didn't have any costs there and the only cost of any size was hiring a bus to go up to Birmingham and, and I, I, I paid for that bus. We had a lot of opposition. In fact, we had to keep the, the location of the Congress secret from the press. We didn't tell anybody that the Congress was taking place until it had started. Um, so now we come to the segment related more to the contemporary issues and uh, Johnny, uh, who kind of has living experiences related to the persecution and um, has written about it also. Um, mm -hmm. Could maybe um, give us an introduction and ask some of the questions related related to this topic. Yes, thank you, Nadja. You brought up to, to our attention the issue of Kosovo and how uh, more than 100,000 of Roma had to flee Kosovo due to the war conditions back there. Mm -hmm. So, um, I know that you, you, you started to work uh, and started to, to think about this question. So can you please tell more about um, your work relating to, to this issue and uh, uh, what can we expect in the future? Kosovo in 1998-9 was a place where something happened that I would say was only secondly bad, only second to the Holocaust because something we, we hear that 130,000 Roma were forced, ethnically cleansed from Kosovo, hundreds were killed, many disappeared, 14,000 homes were burnt and then appropriated, the properties appropriated, and nobody wants to hear about it. And there is a very good reason why they don't want to hear, because when NATO bombed Kosovo and Serbia, some of the soldiers, and we have, this evidence from one particular French soldier, soldiers of NATO, of the K-4 force, were alongside the paramilitaries 
who went systematically from one Roma house to another through all the towns and villages and forced people out and made them give up their homes and allowed other people to occupy those homes. If we obtain that voice that we need to obtain, a political level of, of expressing ourselves, it should be possible to bring some recognition to what happened in that period. Re first of all, recognition, and then even the possibility of bringing legal action that would result in a case of crimes against humanity that occurred in those two years. My connection with Kosovo goes back quite a long way, back to the 1970s, and I had moved to Nish, and you may know that Sait Balic, who was a later president of the World Romani Congress, was working on putting together um, Yugoslav, old Yugoslav Union, if you like, the Savez Roma Yugoslavia, and he was able to organize a smotra, a festival in Pristina, and I went down there with my wife because she, she was dancing with the pralipe, and we, amazingly, when we look back on it, we had a, a, a complete um, cross-table discussion, and not a friendly one, I can tell you, with the leaders of Kosovo, or the Albanian uh, Communist Party people at that time, and I was sitting there as the General Secretary of the World Romani Congress, and next to me was, was um, Said Balic, and he put the point that can there be a Savez, a Roma Savez, in Kosovo that will be affiliated to this new, new idea of the Savez Roma Yugoslavia? And the plain answer was given, no. We don't want you to do that, and we won't allow you to do that. But when those officials went off for their lunch, and we were still sitting there with a sandwich and a cup of coffee, we said, we're going to do it anyway. And we did. We did. What the future, what the outcome of that, I can't tell you was, but we definitely decided we were going to go do the thing that we wanted to do and, and, and really express our right to associate and to come together in the way that we wanted to do it. And so what I hope will happen through this Congress now, the Jubilee Congress, is that we will go back to Pristina on the 13th of June. We will commemorate what happened, even if it's only in a small way, and that is by having a plaque on a private house where, where people died. On the 14th of June, hopefully, and I'm always hopeful, that we will have again such a meeting with the Albanian authorities of today. And I believe they're quite vulnerable, if I may say so, because there is the trial going on in The Hague, so that if at, the, at this very moment we can get ourselves together and show that we are a nation of 10 million, and we are coming down to little Kosovo, and we are asking for your respect, and we are asking you to recognize and see what happened in those years, 1998-99. Now, whether that leads eventually to people wanting to go back to Kosovo, that's an individual decision by many people, but at least we should have a recognition and a respect, and that would be a new starting point. And I hope we can achieve that, and I hope that uh, said John, you better be part of that solution. It, it proves to be a solution. <clears throat> I hope, I hope, I'm looking really forward to it. I'm really looking forward to it. And I just had one more, one more question. Um, you started in 1971, officially, let's say, the wheel of integration when it comes to Roma community. So what do you see, what should we, the new generations now start to, to think about how we should continue the, the fight for being treated as human beings? and having all the rights as the others. What would be your kind of message for, for us, Mr. Buxton? Thank you. It's, it's a terrific question. In fact, I was, of course, active right back in 1962. So, you know, it's, it's nearly 60 years. Well, one of the things I look at, one of the weaknesses, so perhaps it's, it's about 
uh, getting over some of the weaknesses that exist. And one of those weaknesses is that, as somebody said earlier in this discussion, that we have representatives, but they are in position because they've been appointed. They are appointed from the top, let's say by the EU or by the OSCE or by any government who wants to have a Roma specialist in their ranks so they can pretend they're doing something very positive and good. Um, so how do we fill the gap? How do we have it so that we have representatives who are elected, who have a mandate, who have real legitimacy from the communities that they, that they um, represent or say, say they represent? Because I'm not saying they're bad people. We have some very good people who definitely have their heart in the job, but they are in a weak position themselves because they do not have that mandate from the people. So that was why about five years ago, we started this thing called the democratic transition because saying, look, the technology we have today makes it possible to set up our own election system, whereby through an electronic voting system, every ROM around the world could have a vote and decide who their leadership should be in a normal democratic way. Why, not, can't, why can't we do this? So I don't think that we're quite ready for it during this Jubilee Congress, but I think we will try, try out that new kind of democracy. And one of the ways we'll do this is through having what you call referenda. Like if we have an issue on, a, a res, there is a resolution, for instance, that'll come before the Congress saying that the 13th of June shall be always remembered every year now as the commemoration of what happened in Kosovo. And we can put that to a referendum, and we've got quite a lot of people lined up to take part in that. And I hope the Congress will, will uh, you know, create more interest and more people coming into that. So referendum might be the start of it. And we could at least get a team of people together to keep this democratic transition process and build on it until maybe next Congress, we have 50,000 and the Congress after that, we have 100,000. And in the end, why don't we have a million or two million voters? And if we reach that point, I am convinced, I'm convinced one thing, I won't be here, I'm sorry to say, but I'm convinced that the people in political positions in the Romani movement will have great respect and we will be able to wield the political voice and power which is which are you in you are entitled to do simply through your numbers and if i'm talking of the future why well, it won't be long if we have our hundredth a hundredth commemoration our centenary there will be 40 million roma around the world 20 million in europe and 40 million roma around the world that would be some nation and if by that point we have our own elective system we won't only be wielding political power that is appropriate to us, but I think we will be leading the world and showing that a people who have no land, who have not got, who don't want borders, who, who want to see the end of, of geographical borders, we will be a very progressive element in the world showing how to survive and how to have a true democracy and how to be progressive and, and humane. I think we should also uh, have here uh, a bit uh, uh, the Roma language, if you have some message, if you want to something to say, Romanes. Amen Samakate is the slogan of the Congress. We are here and we will not be moved. That was what we were saying back in Ireland. We used to say, Najasa men, we are not going. <laughs> But now we have to say, I mean, just angry. We are going forward. It's a very different situation. There is one other thing I'd like to, to bring up about this Jubilee Congress, and it's not something created by the Congress, but it's an issue that's, that, 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 in, that very much uh, involves everybody. And that is the, the plan by German railways and the state of Berlin, as I understand, to undermine the one most important of our Holocaust memorials in the middle of Berlin. And they want to dig a hole right beside it, which is going to cause a lot of disruption 
to that memorial. And I believe that we all have to oppose that and be ready to, to say no to, to German railways. To say that there is a solution, there is a solution, there is one route that where they want to put this uh, small connecting railway, it can go on a different route, which would not disturb the railway. And I think we have to, I, I believe and I urge that we put down a strong statement that we will not be moved from that place. So that's, that's my kind of uh, ending. But of course, I also want to say to the men to men Bachtale, the Penav Bacht Zor Taisastipe. Shukaras Bankeras, no, it doesn't so. Oh, 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 it doesn't just do. Of Sasto, Sweden. Thank you, Mr. Paxson, for sharing your insights uh, with us. And thank you to all of my colleagues um, asking questions and those um, making this work from the technical um, side. Uh, but also we need to mention that this interview would not be possible without the generous help of the Romani Studies Department. Um, and we are very grateful to uh, the academic director, uh, Ms. Angela uh, Kotze, as well as uh, to our coordinator, uh, Martin Rovid. Uh, we hope that this um, interview conversation that we had will um, help the new generations of activists that it will bring uh, information for, the, for those interested in what this Congress was about and what is its legacy. Uh, at the end, I would like to say that there is no such thing as a perfect activist, nor a perfect movement. What matters is that um, we uh, do things with compassion and uh, that we always manage to see a piece of um, us in someone else. Until another conversation, opre Roma. All right, te blessa.